Okay, so I'll begin then. Yeah, one second. Okay, seems good. Um, all right, so yeah, welcome everyone to this uh, research seminar session. Um, today, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Roslyn Fuller, who is the Managing Director of the Solonian Democracy Institute. And there they research uh, alternative democratic practices, and they track the emergence of democracy enabling technologies and companies. And uh, Roslyn is a, is a lawyer by trade. And today she will tell us more about uh, principles of digital democracy. And yeah, we're very excited to, to having you. So Rosalind, take it away. Thanks yeah, for being okay. here. <laughs> well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, my name is Rosalind Fuller and I've spent a lot of the last 20 years thinking about democracy. Um, originally, as I said, I studied law with a specialization in public international law. So um, humanitarian rights, wars, borders, international trade, things like that. And following that, I wrote my PhD on the relationship between international law and democracy at Trinity College in Dublin, which is where I currently live. And I said, I also manage a small research organization, which in addition to focusing on democracy in general, also analyzes tools of digital democracy. And every two years we publish a report of various tools that facilitate processes of democracy online. We used to do it every year, um, but we had enough time just to do it every two years because not enough changes each year to justify that. So we do this as thoroughly as we can. We also conduct a lot of interviews with citizens who use these tools and with the administrators, so civil servants who use these tools. And we also experiment with them, of course, a lot ourselves to see how they work. Um, and at times we have also conducted security analyses when we have the resources to do that. So I'll be getting back to this in some more concrete detail at the end of my presentation. But first, I'm going to do the typical research thing, because I think it's more important to understand also uh, not just what we're doing, but why we're doing everything, because that informs all of the decisions we make along the way about, about what we do. And that's probably why I also recently wrote a book on the topic of digital democracy. And a big part of the reason I wrote this is that the discussion of digital democracy or I would say even just like democracy in the digital age, has really increasingly departed from the concept of democracy period. And that affects how we also think about the security of the democratic system. In fact, I would say over the past few years, it's become very fashionable to talk about governance in this space rather than about democracy. And those are two completely different things, actually. There have been many really great governors throughout history who were not Democrats. So what you're aiming for, if you're aiming for democracy or you're aiming for good governance, really alters what the major threats to the system are. And I'm not talking here about threats that prevent the system from optimally operating, but rather about threats that have the capacity to thoroughly subvert it and to end it. I think the second thing we have to recognize when we're talking about democracy is that everything we've experienced in our lives up until now has actually been highly abnormal from a historical point of view. And therefore, our previous lived experience doesn't really suffice to give us a thorough understanding of the nature of democracy or how to secure it. For the vast majority of human history, especially since settled civilization, uh, we've been living in non-democracies. And generally, that's been characterized by a few very rich people and many quite poor, relatively poor people. And so history is not linear. We always see this kind of mean reversion to gross inequality and non-democracy, which in other words is called oligarchy. Um, so when we want to keep democracy, we're trying to keep things in an artificial state, not a natural one. So that requires just a lot more energy than most people think to make it happen. Because if you do nothing, if you're just kind of laissez-faire attitude, you're not going to default to a democracy just automatically. You're probably going to default to an oligarchy because that's the natural equilibrium point. And third and finally, it's important to recognize that democracy is not in everyone's best interests, at least not in the short term. Uh, in particular, it's not in the interest of about, like, say, the wealthiest 1% of people, or maybe the 15% of people who also get their paycheck from those people. So it's quite a lot of people, really, overall, who don't necessarily have an incentive to preserve democracy, at least not in its present form. And indeed, under democracy, the very wealthy run the risk that their activities will be regulated or banned by collective decision making. So they definitely have an incentive to destabilize democracy so they can keep doing whatever they like. 
So those are the important considerations about where the weak points of democracy lie, the historical and inevitable reversion to oligarchy, which is always trying to reassert itself, and the desire for an illusory certainty of good governance rather than the struggle for democracy. And I think that really every threat to democracy ultimately comes back to one of these, to these things here. So turning to the digital part of digital democracy, again, very little about when here's in general conversation focuses on the core reasons as to why digitalization would be relevant to democracy. So that is free and equal collective decision-making. Uh, it's a very commonly used analogy, but I think it's still a good one to compare digitalization to the invention of the printing press, particularly the internet, which changed the nature of communication. So from a broadcast medium where you have one entity addressing an audience, so radio, TV, print, to a peer-to-peer -peer medium and one that can bridge distances and time and increasingly also language in a way that previous communication couldn't. So obviously that's all very relevant to communication and there's good reasons why so much dialogue has focused on the communication aspect of this. So the idea of an internet as a public square or a discussion and information forum. But I think as with the printing press, it really cannot and should not stay there. So the printing press is regarded as such a relevant invention today because it contributed to overthrowing the military religious oligarchy that had previously ruled Europe. And today we're the descendants of those people who overthrew that oligarchy and therefore we regard them as you know, completely horrendous, the people who previously ruled. We kind of use the middle ages as a byword for being backwards and non-inventive and repressive and possibly our impression of it is even worse than it actually was because some of the people at the time were actually good governors. So today, like we have a really different situation which I think has influenced the conversation. You know, the printing press was invented in 1450. So coming off the back of a long period of feudalism but also increasingly better trade and contact with other civilizations and a growing merchant plot class, whereas we're coming off the back of several hundred years of very extreme economic growth. And in particular, we've had 80 years of very high levels of equality and democracy, which however, have begun to decelerate and reverse over the last 30 years and really pretty sharply over the last 10. And that's really entirely expected. Uh, according to economists, there's only two spots where Western civilization has taken a big hit to inequality, and that's after the Black Death, and after the world wars. So if you look at the bottom left graph here, you can see inequality increasing between the late middle ages and the first world war. But for the latter half of that period, GDP was going up very, very sharply. And that's why during that period, people, even though inequality was increasing, also living standards for most people also increased at least somewhat during that time. But what's even more interesting about this is to notice like where we all fit into this graph. I mean, all, almost everyone alive today was born after the second world, at the first world war. So you can see we haven't just grown up and experienced ourselves a situation of more equality, also economic equality. We've actually lived in a situation where equality has continued to increase for a really long period of time, a really unnatural period of time. And that's influenced how we've all thought about democracy and economics and security. So it's really important to understand this trajectory because I think the language hasn't quite caught up to the reality on this point. And that's why the conversation has become really illogical. Um, and it's why the official discourse today regards the internet as a threat to good governance and technically as a spreader of unapproved information. So kind of a new idea of, of heresy. And that's really the defense of very, very newly acquired undemocratic power. That's kind of happened so fast that I don't think people have really had a chance to adjust to it for the most part. And I think that manifests itself in several ways. One is that open debate has been recast as highly, highly dangerous. So unfortunately what that means is we're losing the idea that information cannot be processed and scrutinized to determine its veracity. I mean, since the enlightenment, we've believed that ideas can be formulated and we can test those ideas to see if they're true or not. So we don't need to prevent people from saying them. We can just put it through this kind of funnel where we can use evidence to a certain way or not things are true. So however, if you kind of believe that that's impossible and people aren't capable of doing that, then you can see how you can jump very quickly to the idea that this is sowing discord or being divisive and it's a traitorous act rather than just being part of the process to determine what the truth is or get as close to it as we can because we, we can't always get to it exactly. Um, another issue that we've seen more and more and this is especially coming from the legal point of view is that we've had a lot of transfer of decision-making power to institutions that have little or no public accountability. So for example, uh, central banks would be a very common one but also the institutions of uh, international treaties. So a lot of decision-making has gone 
into uh, courts that have been based on international treaties. So it's kind of a locked in decision now. Um, or sometimes there are also transferred decision making powers transferred to specialized agencies. It may be transferred to NGOs or civil servants. But it's something that's very, very far progressed and something that a lot has been written about sociologically and in the legal world, this transfer of power out of the democratic process to different organizations that then make those decisions. Um, another aspect of this that I think really gets ignored a lot is enshrining rights into constitutions, which has become very, very common recently. And it's it's easy to see. You'd think, oh, that's very democratic. You have a right in the constitution. That's what most people would think. Um, but the truth is, once you enshrine a right in the constitution, obviously judges make the decisions over it. So judges determine the content of that right going forward. So when you enshrine a right into a constitution, you run the danger that it's interpreted rather differently than was originally intended, especially over time. If you look at the US, you can really see this happening in the US, where their constitution is so old that their interpretation has gone off into completely different directions, and no one can really pull back to the constitution anymore because it's also like too old to really support that. So this is an issue sometimes, we call that the counter-majoritarian difficulty in law, which is where courts start to go one way and you know maybe people and opinions start to go another way and we don't bridge that again. So that's also something that's happened more and more and more and more uh, when it really is actually quite harmful really. I mean, you can regulate things in a um, simple law as well and then you can regulate them again or make adjustments more easily. So, and finally, a third is that the tax burden for the social welfare system has now been shifted to the middle class, which will probably collapse under the weight of that. Um, and that's creating a social structure that's also more typical of an oligarchy, where there's a small number of wealthy people and a lot of poor people, rather than having a strong middle class that feels stronger in its uh, content as a middle class and, you know, isn't worried about the future because the middle class is usually the leading power in any democracy. And it's been that way since ancient Greece. So... Past tense, we've already lost a lot of the basic pillars of democracy or we're in the process of losing them. So free speech and open debate, uh, decision-making and economic independence, which is also very important. So we've kind of come to a very anti-democratic approach to politics. And I think almost all discussions, including questions of security are reflecting this kind of new and somewhat faulty understanding of democracy. So rather than viewing it as a system for scrutinizing ideas, and then voting on them on the basis of one person, one vote. Digital democracy is now seen as a discussion of politics for no particular reason, you know, on social media, with often with complete strangers. These could be people living in completely different countries that you're never going to need to make a democratic decision with. Um, and then maybe at times going to a ballot box in the countries, the few countries that do allow that, like Estonia or parts of Canada or some countries for expat voters and maybe casting a ballot for a representative. And the challenge, according to this new understanding of democracy, is to control this online process so that it yields the right results at the, battle, at, the, at the ballot box. So we can kind of see this mean reversion to oligarchy well, well underway, because I mean, I can't state enough how much richer some people have become very, very recently. Um, but we have to understand how it works in a little bit more detail in order to think how you could really prevent it. So essentially, it's just because small advantages accrue into greater ones over time. Um, Robert Michels wrote a book about this in the early 20th century, detailing how party functionaries would gradually accrue power and subvert inner party democracy. And that idea became known as the iron law of oligarchy. Now, I, not knowing who Robert Michels was at the time, because I studied law, not politics, I separately came to a rather similar conclusion while I was writing my PhD about how democracy would be undermined on a nationwide basis through a similar mechanism. And I call this the hot dates hypothesis, although it was a hypothesis 15 years ago, like today it's just a reality because everything's kind of come to pass. So basically it just amounts to the very simple realization that if you have a system with bottlenecks, in order to dominate the system, you just have to take over the bottleneck. So as software engineers, you're probably all very familiar with that situation. And the reason I call it the hot gates is based on a battle in ancient Greece at the time. Uh, the Persians were invading Greece and the Greeks were vastly outnumbered and things weren't looking very good for them. So as part of their strategy, they decided to send a small force to the strategic point, the hot gates. If you've seen the movie 300, that's what it's based on. And their point was to hold off the Persian army as long as they could. So, and they managed to do that for a few days until someone told the Persians how to get around this, which they did. Uh, but it, it made the point of delaying them for quite a while. And so the issue is war basically is all about controlling strategic points. And politics is the continuation of war by other means. And that's why we say ballots, not bullets. Like a lot of the time, people just think that's like a fun, it's a nice thing to say and it sounds good. But we really do mean that because politics is contested and politics is a system where different interests, interests compete with each other and do have 
difficulties to resolve. And often if they do not resolve them by ballots, they resolve them by bullets. So coming from an international law background, like we mean that absolutely. Um, in the electoral representative democracy system that we're all familiar with, you only have a few collective decision points. This is really what it comes down to every three years. So it's just imperative to win control of those points. After you win, you're in a position to do two things. One is to lock in the advantages of that win. So they cannot be changed later at a, at, at, a, at a later point by other democratic decisions. And unfortunately, people have just become very, very open about that as a goal now. And the second is, of course, you can help all the people who help you win, which again, is just becoming more and more self-understood as a goal that people are pursuing. So the issue is that if you portray this out over many iterations, rather than having a society where you have a lot of different people floating around doing their own thing, like people, um, you know, you might be a small business owner, but you might belong to an NGO, or you might be in a political party, and you also might work at a corporation, and kind of people are flowing around freely as depicted on the left side of this little slide, people start to form themselves into two very aligned factions, or it could be three factions, but usually it's two in the end. And those factions really go to war with each other to try to win control over the society more and more and more and more and more seriously. And this is all very relevant for the security of digital democracy and the way in which we can use digitalization to impact democracy for the better. Because in a scenario where everything's like really low key and there's multiple parties and there's relatively accurate polling and you don't feel that desperation, okay, like someone could show up and ruin your digital vote in Estonia or Ontario or wherever and it would be embarrassing and it would be disruptive, but it wouldn't be a panic situation. But in the scenario where you have a political situation that's extremely fraught, even with really good security around voting, you're going to end up with people who have extreme incentives to attack that bottleneck in a way where they're either not discovered, you know, unlike hackers who like to tell everyone what they did, right? In a way where they're not discovered, or if they are, the discovery doesn't have consequences. So that's what I would worry about a lot more, the people who aren't discovered. Uh, uh, flipping elections. And unfortunately, like that's true regardless of the medium used. This is just like a general basic principle. So if we look at paper ballots versus digital voting, the obvious advantage of paper is that it's like it's easy to understand. Everyone knows how it works. And people can obviously watch the ballots being counted. And later, of course, you have the ballots. So you can always recount those same ballots. But I think an equally important issue that's really overlooked is what happens before that point. Because the security around paper elections in Western countries has actually been historically very low when you look at it. Um, in Canada, you can say, oh, yeah, this is Fred, so he's going to vote today. And people say, sure, OK, here's your ballot paper, Fred. Right. I mean, and we've just been running on that principle for the last like 50, 60 years because we haven't been concerned about the election security. It hasn't been a big deal. Um, and, and unfortunately, it has gotten lower in recent years because there's postal voting, there's vote drop off and there's vote harvesting and things like that. And those have all kind of made the security around voting actually way, way harder to control. And so this can be a real issue because it really like opens the door to all kinds of things also on paper. I mean, if you look at a place like the United States, um, but also other countries, there's people who their lifelong don't vote. Um, in US presidential elections, the vote turnout is usually about 60%. So that means 40% of people don't turn out to vote. And once people don't turn out to vote, they very rarely do start voting. So it's quite easy to potentially fake a vote for somebody like that. I mean, as I said, this counts online and offline. There's also issues around increasing rates of severe dementia. So we would call granny harvesting, which also happens offline. Um, there's also issues with widespread drug use, functional illiteracy. So all of these social problems make it easier and easier and easier to fake votes because it's very hard to to prove that they were correct as submitted because it's very, very hard to recreate the day of the election. So people often, for example, falsely remember if they voted. It's a very well-known thing that sometimes more people, lots, a lot of the time, more people will say they voted than did because it's like a good thing to go voting. So that's something people falsely remember. Um, the people, of course, it's very easy for them to forget who exactly they voted for. Um, and even if you were to go to check, even if you go to people's doors and try to check who they voted for, that's a violation of their privacy. That's potentially also voter intimidation. So you can't really recreate that. And countries have tried to solve that two different ways offline. One is like in Ireland, for example, you have ballots that cannot be reunited with the voter. So once you cast your ballot, there's nothing on it that could prove that it's you that cast that vote. So that's it, after it goes in, it's, it's the end. But in England, for example, you do have, as some of you probably know, they do have um, 
numbers on their stubs. So you can potentially match up ballots later on. You could trace a ballot to the voter who cast it and you could technically check election fraud that way. Um, however, the problem with that system is of course, it's technically possible for someone to go to get access to those ballots and go through those ballots and maybe harass people who vote for parties or fringe parties that they don't want them to vote for, like the Communist Party or something. So we haven't, my point is just that we haven't really solved this on paper either. We're often trying to square a circle digitally that we've not ever really truly succeeded in squaring on paper. And it's very obvious when you look at, at developing countries, a lot of the times they struggle with these issues, but it's just because there's so much more at stake in those countries than there usually is in, de in developed countries where we've been just kind of pretty blasé about voting security, frankly. So there's all kinds of issues and all kinds of ways. I mean, I've listed a few gerrymandering, clientelism. There's like all kinds of ways you can corrupt politics other than just through through the ballot box. Um, so I think the issue, however, we're ultimately faced with is if things keep going this way, if, you know, the rich keep getting richer and keep interfering with, with elections or other political decisions um, in ways that have become newly possible. And if we keep moving also decision-making power outside of the political realm to sometimes supranational entities, but also, you know, maybe agencies and things like that, how could we ever really achieve security in the system? And if we did achieve it, like what good would it do us if we're not making the political decisions in that system? You'd have a perfect security for something that doesn't matter, which doesn't interest anybody. So I think this is like the real threat to democracy today, like, you know, not just to voting, but to the concept of democracy period, which I think is really the most important thing. And we have to ask ourselves, like, how can we how can we mitigate that? How can we possibly try to stop this? Well, I would say for one thing, by doing the same thing the Persians did, you want to eliminate the effects of those bottlenecks, which is causing this issue. You want to get around it. In electoral democracy, you know, the representative is a real pressure point. Uh, there's very few representatives, so they're a lot easier uh, to deal with than to have to do with voters. And we end up with this very lopsided situation where you can have a few entities um, kind of putting pressure on, vote, on, on representatives in a way that outweighs potentially their voters. So typically speaking, corporations, you know, you see this in the US with like Citizens United, corporations, our investment funds are sometimes even just very, very, very rich individuals. Um, kind of operate through vehicles, like they don't, they wouldn't operate as themselves, they operate through vehicles um, to get done what they want to have done. So an issue that we've been contending with a lot in the last few years, I think there are people beginning to report on this, but it's something that's happened so recently that it hasn't really been visible, is um, people basically funding very large NGOs and they pay people to work at those NGOs quite a lot. So, um, and they lobby politicians or they, um, you know, kind of flood newspapers with sponsored content. So a really common thing you see would be for uh, organizations like charitable organizations to give newspapers very, very large sums of money. And then those newspapers print their content under so-called sponsored content. Um, or you'll read newspaper articles where they cite like five or six organizations. And if you do research and you look who is behind all those organizations, a lot of the time you find the same person. So you're not really getting this view that you think you're getting of maybe five or six mass member organizations. You're actually just getting the view of, of one person. And investment funds do this a lot now too, unfortunately. And it's really skewing how democracy works. I mean, this is just one small example that I did. I took from a newspaper article I wrote a few years ago. Um, but the top four organizations there, like Omidyar Network, Luminate, Democracy Fund, Democracy Fund Voice, those are all um, funded by Pierre Omidyar who's the eBay billionaire, as you guys probably know, <laughs> but most people don't. So, so these are only like four organizations, like Omidyar actually runs a whole lot of other organizations. And this is only a very, 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 very tiny little, little bit of some of the organizations they're funding. I think, I think that if I was going to write at this resolution, I could probably fill like half of a football field just with organizations that the Omidyars are, are funding and counterfunding. And then there's all kinds of other ones as well. So the problem with this is like, Often these organizations, not just Omidyar, like I'm not picking on him, there's a lot out there. They're very, very, very polarizing in how they approach things. And they're very um, controlling in, in how they want to attack political issues. And this has created a lot of issues for online participation. So I think one really great thing about what I would call user authenticated online participation. So things that a lot of the digital tools we use do where you have to, to sign up as yourself and be authenticated from a voter list. Um, what's great, what, what's really great about it is that it kicks out all of these other actors. 
So rather than having a network that exists like on Twitter or, or Facebook or something else like that, where all these organizations and the thousands of people who work for them are all in a network together and able to amplify each other and pick on other people, suddenly everyone's just reduced to being themselves. And you can only participate if you live in that locality, that area, whether it's a municipality or a state or even a nation where the decision is being taken. Those are the only people who are allowed to participate because those are the only people who have the right to vote. And what's interesting about this is I do have uh, examples of this, is that it actually, in real life, does prevent the conversation. It, it has changed conversations from being these highly polarized, like complete free for all conversation going nowhere into something that's a lot more pragmatic and constructive when they basically have had ones where they use user authenticated uh, participation. And that's like, it's without censor. You don't have to censor anybody because like Luminate is not a person. You don't have to shadow ban people because that's not what it's about. You don't have to control content or otherwise infringe on anyone's rights, which is where the discussion is all going on social media, right? Which is from a legal point of view, very, very dangerous. So it actually, just by saying we have a democracy and in that democracy, only natural people can vote. And we have tools where we can check if you're a natural person or if you're actually a big NGO, you already have cut off like 90% of the problems that we have and also gotten rid of all of this kind of money, money equals power situation that we have going on. What else can you do? Well, okay, infrequent decision points obviously are helping to move decisions beyond politics because you can say, oh, sorry, we signed a treaty about that. We can't revisit it ever, right? So uh, that's very, very frustrating. And it allows you to potentially like solidify a situation and have a situation going on for longer than its sell by date. So how do you prevent that solidifying? Well, I would say by liquefying the situation. So one way that can also be done is through citizen initiated referendums. And Switzerland is obviously the most famous example of this where you can petition and if you get enough signatures, you can start a referendum that way. Um, and that way you can also get more control over the basic decisions of the society that, you know, they prevent corruption, it prevents locking in advantages and policy that goes against the wishes of the majority. So I don't think it is appropriate to focus on like the minutiae of referendum. Like some people say, oh, that's great. We could have a referendum over every little thing. I would actually say it's better to have a few referendums over the major issues. So even if you only had two referendums a year, which I think is like actually pretty normal, like in, in Switzerland, they're averaging 12 a year the last long while. In Ireland, we've probably averaged about one a year for quite a long time now. Even if you're just doing that much, like two referendums a year after four years, that's eight referendums, you're actually having quite a big impact, actually, if you're dealing with the, the basic questions. And I mean, of course, you can do this offline like they do in Switzerland, uh, where as far as I'm aware, they have been on and off doing like digital voting for as long as I can remember. They keep starting it, they keep stopping it. Um, but but it is possible, of course, also would be possible to do this this online, because if you think also of a single single dimensional vote, right, because referendums are yes and no, and you're voting over an area that doesn't have small constituencies, but rather larger areas, and it's going to be easier to pull for that. It's going to be easier to hack, catch hacking, and it's going to be easier to rerun it if there is hacking than, say, an election would be, because if an election's hacked, okay, now you're minus a government and you're kind of in a, in a crisis situation. Whereas if you had an issue, if you were to have an issue with the referendum, you could be like, fine, we'll rerun the referendum. But in the meantime, we do, we do have a government. So it kind of just pushes down the level of um, anxiety and insecurity people have to have about those things. Even if you don't vote online, you can collect signatures for a petition to initiate a referendum online, obviously, which just helps to facilitate that whole situation. And Obviously, not every referendum is successful in the sense that it's passed. Like referendums tend to be voted no on more often than they're voted yes on. However, even in that case, you're going, you're allowing people to go through the democratic process, you know, to take an issue that's important to people. I mean, think about something like the, you know, farmers protest we've had recently all over Europe, right? Like you're allowing people to take an issue that's important to them. And rather than just be frustrated and rather than this all just become a big problem, you can take potentially something people want and push it through this the system. They may not get what they want in the end, but at least everybody knows how and why and what it failed on rather than just, you know, no one does anything and everything just continues to descend into chaos, right? You always gives you more information, a referendum than you had before. And you can always say, okay, maybe in four years, we make a small amendment and we, we run it again, right? We've done that a lot here in Ireland where we amend things and we, we have another referendum on it. So I'd say most importantly, like frequent decision-making, which is possible digitally, um, or also offline for that matter, um, it really helps to lessen this need for over-alignment. Because when you start to make decisions on issues, 
you don't have to come to a party agreement on what everybody thinks on this issue. Like increasingly parties are more filled with activists than with professional politicians. And they often demand that people are aligned on topics that like there's not even a natural alignment on those topics. Like there's no reason why you should agree on the on gun and health care. Like those are two completely different issues, right? So uh, politics, because of this insistence on over alignment, like there's one group here and there's another group here and they each agree on everything with each other. Um, it's kind of become more like this kind of weird religion, you know, where there's like uh, beliefs we must hold rather than saying this is like you see on the left, how things used to be, you know, a pluralistic society composed of different interests. Everything has pros and cons. So when you make decisions on issues, you can kind of just force to disaggregate a bit. You know, you can afford to say, fine, you know, I don't need to agree with you on everything. Uh, we, we vote on this one thing and we can make up our mind about the next thing tomorrow. So I think I think that helps a lot to kind of start to reduce this, this tension that we have here. And finally, of course, digital technology is useful for monitoring budgeting and implementation. So in many Western countries, there's actually been an increase in the number of civil servants. Um, and also there's been a lot of inefficiencies in how public money is spent. So, I mean, here in Ireland, I've been living in North Dublin for 18 years. There were two big infrastructure projects that were just about to be done when I moved here. And there are people who are in university now who, who, weren't, who weren't born back then before these infrastructure projects were started. And I know like the Berlin airport is like another example of this. There's just, there's just so many of those, of those things everywhere. So Unfortunately, rather than doing these democratic things we could be doing, you know, which usually we do through online consultation or online participatory budgeting, in my experience, unfortunately, and in trying to research this book, I just ran into it again and again and again, there's a lot of no follow up on what happens to people's participation. So I, I ran into a lot of cases. I mean, obviously, there's some good ones out there, but I did run into a lot of cases where people would run these really convoluted and really well done and very informative online public consultations, and then they just like drop the results. <laughs> Like nobody, nobody knows how that impacted the decisions that were later made. Like even I couldn't get that information trying to get it again and again and again and again, let alone, you know, a person who just happens to live in that municipality who probably is not going to put the same effort into that, that, that I did. So it's really bad because it's a really missed opportunity, I think. Um, because in my experience, the participants in digital democracy, they usually veto what I would call the prestige projects. Um, and they usually really focus on the basics, like public libraries, healthcare, utilities, like some sports facilities or education, depending on the, on the place. And they're typically like really, really, really interested in the financial aspects of that. They're always looking for ways to try to like eliminate waste and be more efficient because it's their tax money that's paying for it. So it's like a really missed opportunity to get those eyeballs on that and see that. So, and it's also just a pity because digital technology obviously has that efficiency and storage capacity to track implementation on it quite easily. And there's all kinds of digital tools that have this already built in, like these trackers for implementation, they're just very poorly used. So like the technology will be there and it, you'll just get to this point where, oh, no one filled up that spot. You know, even though you entirely could, and it would be really, really helpful. And I think people would feel a lot less frustrated if they could see that. I mean, as I'm saying, there's some exceptions, but it's, it's a common problem. Um, so we also have to say, of course, this helps us to say, did we achieve what we wanted to achieve with this idea? Or should we go back to the drawing board? So, you know, there's all kinds of things that, that that's useful for. Um, so unfortunately, in closing today, I would say there's kind of an issue that we're kind of seeing the issues of democracy today, a lot of the time through the lens of the very rich, because they're paying for that lens. You know, we're kind of clamping down on heresy, like really over, over focused on that. Um, and kind of trying to preserve things the way they are rather than dealing with issues as life goes on and things change. Um, you know, for me, like, it's not an issue that I'm maybe in deep disagreement with my neighbor about some political issue. It really doesn't matter. We just both go vote. Um, it, it doesn't bother me. It's actually good that they're there so I can reconsider my opinion on things and ask myself if, if I have my thoughts in order about why I think what I do. I think it's actually good. Um, I don't think that, I think misinformation has been really exaggerated as an issue because we do have methods for checking misinformation. Like we have journalistic methods for doing this. We have evidence-based trials. We have cross-examining. We invented all these things for reasons. We have ways of determining the veracity of claims. We're just increasingly not using them. So I think, unfortunately, um, I would say focusing on securing the voting process itself, whether offline or offline is incredibly important, of course. Um, but at the same time, bottlenecks will always be a weak point and lack of transparency will always be a weak point. And that I think, therefore, by putting more energy into facilitating more continuous and less high stakes participation, 
we can kind of make a contribution to lessening that security burden around elections, whether that's paper or digital. And I think this will also help to reverse the great wealth inequality that's arisen due to an over-reliance on electoral representative democracy. Okay, thank you, that's it. Great, thanks a lot, Rosalind, for this very insightful talk. Let me briefly stop the recording in the live stream, and then we can 